Calculus is the study of change. It gives us a set of mathematical tools to analyze how the world is changing, and not just changing over a long duration of time, how things are changing right now. But before we can dig into calculus and appreciate its power, I want to take us back to ancient Greece, to a problem raised by the philosopher Zeno. Zeno was thinking about the nature of change and this question of instantaneous change. How quickly are things changing in any given instant? And so Zeno imagined a flying arrow. You shoot an arrow and you can imagine it's moving over time. It has some velocity. And you learn in high school various tools to measure that velocity. If you want to know how quickly the arrow is moving, you can ask, well, how far did it travel and how long did it take it? If the arrow traveled a thousand feet over five seconds, then you can do the change in position, a thousand, divided by the change in time, five, and say the arrow was traveling 200 feet per second. But notice that is an average velocity. You imagine probably when you first fired the arrow, it was moving a little bit faster. And then over time, hitting arrow resistance, it begun to slow down. So how can we know how quickly the arrow is get moving at any given instant? As Zeno was reflecting upon this, he realized there's a paradox. Because if you imagine the arrow flying and you were to pause it at any given moment, imagine taking a picture, what would you see? At that instant, the arrow appears to be stationary. It's not moving. There's no movement at all. And it's not just true at that instant, it's true at every given instant. The arrow is stationary. And yet somehow, those instants of a stationary arrow add up to a moving arrow. How can this be? If at every given instant, the arrow is not moving, how is it possible that over a duration of time, the arrow moves? It seems like it should be stuck. It seems like we should all be stuck. After all, at any given instant, take a picture, nothing's moving in that picture. So how is motion possible? This might just seem like some abstract philosophy problem, but it turns out it's quite useful. Recently, Campus Safety contacted me to give me a traffic citation for failing to stop at a stop sign. Now, of course, I decided to fight campus safety about this. And so I went in to object to this citation. And when I went in, they put on a video and played a video of me driving through a stop sign. It seemed like from the video, allegedly, that I had failed to stop. It seemed like they had caught me on this one. But, I thought back to Zeno's paradox, and so I asked them, what did you just show me? A video. But what is a video? A series of images. And in every single image in that video, my car is stationary. You can't give me a, vi a, a citation for not stopping if at every instant I was stopped. Okay, you can think through if that's a compelling argument or not, but it seems like Zeno raises quite a problem for us. How is motion even possible? The answer to this comes in the calculus. It took almost 2,000 years for us to figure out the mathematics to answer Zeno's question. And that's what I want to share with you today. To do so, let's get an equation to model the motion of this arrow. Let's say that at time t, the position of the arrow can be given by, say, minus 5t squared plus 50t. So at time 0, if you plug 0 into this, it's at position 0. At time 1, if you plug 1 into this, you get minus 5 plus 50, so you get 45. Maybe we'll say this is meters. So it's moved 45 meters that first second. At time 2, you can plug 2 into it, minus 20 plus 100, it's now at 80 meters. 
So at any given time, you can plug that time in and figure out the position of the arrow. And let's try and figure out what is the instantaneous velocity? How quickly is the arrow moving at exactly two seconds when your time equals two seconds? Now this is where Zeno says, well, at exactly two seconds, if you were to freeze time and look, the arrow's not moving at all. True. But what we can begin to do, and this is the great insight of calculus, is instead of thinking about this problem of instantaneous velocity, because it does seem quite tricky, we're instead just going to think back to average velocity. We don't know what's happening at exactly two seconds, but let's think about what's happening from, say, between two and three seconds. At, at, at two seconds, it was at 80 feet. At three seconds, it's a little bit further. Or 80 meters, at three seconds, it's a little bit further. So let's find the velocity between time two and time three. So to calculate this velocity, we'll need to plug these times into our positions. We need to figure out the position at time three, figure out its difference with the position at time two, and then divide that by the change in time, three minus two. If we go ahead and do that, let's plug three into here. Three squared is nine times five, 45, minus 45 and 150, so that gives you 105. Plug two in, we already said that's gonna be 80. So the gap between 105 and 80 is just 25, and the differences of times is one, so dividing by one, you get 25, meters per second. Now this isn't what we wanted to know. We want to know how quickly it's moving at exactly two seconds. But at least we know that, that from two seconds to three seconds, during that interval, there was an average velocity, this is an average velocity, of 25 meters per second. Now if you want to say, yeah, but what's happening at exactly two seconds, what we're going to do now is we're going to shrink the interval we're looking at. Instead of asking what happens from two seconds to three seconds, we're going to zoom in and ask, what is the average velocity from two seconds to just a little bit more than two, say 2.1? And if you were to calculate that out, same way, position at time 2.1 minus the position at time two, all over 2.1 minus Two. What is the position at time 2.1? Well, we plug 2.1 into this equation. 2.1 squared is 4.41 times that by 5. That's 22.05. We're going to subtract that from 50 times 2.01, which is 105. So subtracting those, you get 82.95. Position at time 2, plug 2 in. We've already seen it's 80 all over the difference between 2.1 and 2, which is 0.1. This will leave us with 2.95 divided by 0 0.1, or 29.5 meters per second. So when, when time was going from two seconds to just a moment later, 2.1 seconds, that tenth of a second, during that interval at an average velocity, of 29.5 meters per second. But that still isn't quite telling you what is the instantaneous velocity at exactly two seconds. So what could you do? Well, you could keep zooming in even further. Maybe instead of going from two to 2.1, someone could come along and, and say, calculate the average velocity from, from let's say two to 2.01. Zoom, even instead of a tenth of a second, we only let the story run for a hundredth of a second. And if you calculate that out, you would get 29.95 meters per second. You, you can keep going, you could zoom in even closer from 2 to 2.001 or 2.001, and, and you can work it out, and, and you can might, might make a guess, it seems like, when you're shrinking this interval to make it shorter, it went from 25 meters per second to 29.5 meters per second, shrinking even more, 29.95 meters per second. Well, well, then you can ask, is there some trend? 
What is happening as we make the intervals of time shorter and shorter and shorter? It seems like these numbers are getting closer and closer to 30. It seems like this instantaneous velocity is, is going to be 30 meters per second. But how can we be sure? How do we know that if you keep shrinking down the interval smaller, it won't suddenly jump to 40 or 50 or 60? Ah, here's what algebra is going to help us out. What we're going to do now is instead of just keep zooming closer and closer and closer, we're going to look at all of the intervals at once by asking what is the average velocity from time 2 to some arbitrary time t. t could be 2.1 or 2.01 or 2.001. Let's calculate it in general for any t. What do we get? Just like before, we would do p of that time t, just a variable t, minus p of 2 all over the difference between t and 2. What does that give you? Well, what is p of t? p of t is just our expression. It's minus 5t squared plus 50t, and then there's a minus p of 2. And we said p of 2 is 80. When you plug 2 in, you get 80. So minus 80 from the minus p of 2. Then we want to divide that all by t minus 2. Now, I know this looks like a complete mess, but notice what happens. Up top, we can pull out a minus 5. And if you factor out a minus 5, you're left with a t squared, a minus 10t, and a plus 16. And that expression further factors down. That's just t minus 2 times t minus 8. So then when you go and you divide by the t minus 2, that will just cancel. You're left with the average velocity from 2 to t for any time t is minus 5 times t minus 8. Go ahead and test over some of these previous ones. Like, what is the average velocity from 2 to 3? Well, you can just plug 3 in for your t. 3 minus 8 is minus 5 times minus 5 is 25. Sure enough, it seems to work. So then what we want to do to find the instantaneous velocity, this is the great insight, this is Isaac Newton's great insight in developing the calculus, is instantaneous velocity is what happens when that t is just going to get closer and closer and closer to 2. You're just looking at the smallest possible interval of time. It doesn't make sense to look at just a single instant of time, run into Zeno's paradox, but we look at an infinitesimally small interval of time. And so I'm going to say what we want to do is we want to take the limit as my t gets closer and closer to 2. So I write limit, L-I-M for limit, as t approaches 2. So for each of these, I want to think about what is the limit of this as t is getting closer and closer to 2? What is the limit of this as t is getting closer and closer to 2? What's the limit as t gets closer and closer to 2? Now, in upcoming videos, we'll talk more about how to analyze this, but just think, if you plug in a number really, really close to 2, then when you subtract 8 from it, it should be really, really close to minus 6, right? If it's really close to 2 and you subtract 8, it should be get really close to minus 6. And then you times that minus 6 by that minus 5, and you should come up with 30 meters per second, just like we expected. So don't miss the, the, the profound insight of calculus. There's a lot of math here you can get lost in. But the big idea is simply this. Rather than thinking of time as an interval that's made up of these little instants, instead say an instant is what happens when you shrink down an interval of time. It's the interval that's fundamental. The instant is just the limit of shrinking that smaller and smaller and smaller. And when you come at it this way, instead of getting arrows that are stuck in the air and not moving, we can actually begin to make sense of what do we mean by instantaneous velocity. We can begin to understand change as it's happening right now.